Okay, um, yes, as we talked about, I went ahead and did kick ass and super last week to kind of coincide with Deadpool. Um, because this weekend, obviously, uh, would it be a romantic one? Because um, this, this actually falls on that day, does it not? It does. Okay. Um, the Baptist. <laughs> right. So, um, I decided to do another romantic one, and I had to kind of come up with that on the fly, and then just another one of those ones that should have been obvious a long time ago. Um, finally. I was gonna throw, um, When Harry Met Sally into this instead of You've Got Mail, but I thought, no, let's just kind of just kind of keep the Efron Hanks, uh, Meg Ryan thing going. Efron wrote, uh, When Harry Met Sally. Right. But we'll stick with the Hanks thing. Uh, <laughs> so, not to mention that these two are basically the same movie. Just with different technology. <laughs> um... So, I think Sleuths in Seattle is typically the more beloved and popular one. Oh, but, yeah. But we're going to go ahead and start with You've Got Mail, I think. Um, which obviously is a remake of The Shop Around the Corner with Jimmy Stewart. Um, and this is obviously set in a time when um, this was a very, very popular phrase that you'd hear in that little computer voice whenever you turned it on. Yes. Um, after you heard the, you hear the uh, buzzing of the phone and shit. You see the, uh, you see the logo, and then you see the running guy, and then you see, like, it's like him and his family, or it's people celebrating. I never figured that one out. But <laughs> it's, it's people that are very happy that you are online, regardless. So, um... And it's in this very innocent time where you could go on the internet and talk to a total complete stranger and they were a nice person. They were not a predator or out to take your skin off of your body. Um, so I'm sure they were out there at the time, but not in this movie. So we're good. <laughs> um, and they're just, we don't really, I think she kind of vaguely tells us how it begins, but we still, I still don't really recall ever really knowing. Um, but when the movie starts, um, they're just like anonymous pen pals. Right. Um, he's like New York and then a number, and she is shop girl. And she is with Greg Kinnear, and he's with Parker Posey. Um, so things are nice, you know. Um, I mean, Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan, they're nice, but, you know, Greg Kinnear and Parker Posey, both are doing pretty well. Oh, yeah. Um, except that, um, Parker Posey is a little crazy, and Greg Kinnear is a little, uh, I guess neurotic. So they they gotta have problems because you know there's just of we've course. got we've gotta have things that bring these two together and you can't have uh the other significant others be people that they're gonna stick with. You have to kind of work things into the screenplay to make sure that they are we can reasonably leave them behind. <laughs> but that was before this was driven into the ground though in later years. Mm -hmm. So um they go back and forth, and one of them's very much a guy, and one of them's very much a girl. She loves reading Pride and Prejudice and thinks that Elizabeth Bennet is the most complex character in literary history, and he thinks the, that the Godfather has the questions, has the answers to all of life's questions, and it's very... <laughs> it's, uh, it's very much that. Um, but obviously, um... With two people as perfectly cast as this, um, with such chemistry as this, the comment on the back of this DVD box is, Tom Ranks and Meg Ryan should win the Nobel Prize for chemistry. Oh, God. <laughs> Who said what? that? Um, Susan... Somebody from USA Today, with a very long last name. Susan from USA Today. And yes. <laughs> in the 90s said that. So, um... And, of course, we have this concept where, obviously, when they're pen pals, they are completely anonymous... Um, but something absolutely, no pun intended, clicks. But then, god damn. But then, um, there's another thing going on here, of course, which is Meg Ryan runs a small, tiny, little bookstore that's been open for like 40 years. Um, that's basically going out of business. They're just barely, barely hanging on. So, uh, Tom Hanks and the company run by his dad, who is Daphne Goldman, because Daphne Goldman is always the boss. Yes, he is. <laughs> Um, have this giant chain store, um, that they're just gonna bring in. It kind of looks like, um, um, I guess Barnes & Noble's probably what I'm thinking of. Maybe. Um, 
uh, that's going to drop right into this town and basically destroy her little tiny bookshop. Um, so they're enemies, and they know they're enemies, but they don't know they're also each other's pen pal. Uh, I know it's weird. You'd think, um, because they interact a lot when they don't know that they're pen pals, but when they know they hate each other. But with the things they talk about, like with the Godfather connection, and the fact that her name is fucking Shop Girl, you'd think they'd eventually figure this out. Yeah. Um, but no, the movie, um, continuously keeps them apart until we can get to that inevitable conclusion where they end up together, and... We're all happy anyway because it's Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. <laughs> Fair enough. We don't predict, keep it predictable, do all the cliches, whatever you want to do. We want to see them together anyway because that's just how the movie works. Um, this was back when you actually wanted that to happen. If this movie were to come out today and star people I didn't care about, this movie would be unbearable and I would hate it. They kind of the, this is kind of the main um, thing they're targeting in uh, They Came Together, the Paul Rudd, Amy Poehler spoof movie. Mm -hmm. Um, which I didn't care for, but a lot of people kind of took David Wayne did it. Yes. Um, this was basically the target of that movie because it's basically like the ultimate 90s romantic comedy. There were a lot of those, um, but this one's definitely in that roster for sure. Um, even down to the, the title now is synonymous with just fucking, just every romantic comedy you think of. Um, so... Yes, um, but going on, uh, some of our supporting players, we have, um, Greg Kinnear, obviously, is very, he was right fresh off of As Good As It Gets here, um, and playing this character who could have been unlikable, he's obviously, he's, like I said, they're basically the same movie, he's taking the place of Bill Pullman in Sleepless in Seattle, it's exactly who he is. He's the guy who's good for her, and they have a nice relationship, and there's really no, you know, tension between them, they're a nice couple, but they're not uh, together forever, couple. They're they're to the point to where they're kind of too perfect together. Um, so he obsesses over typewriters, which is really funny since Tom Hanks in real life is a typewriter enthusiast. <laughs> um, it's kind of confusing when you're watching the movie and you know that about Tom Hanks and you're trying to. <laughs> um, and then there is um, Parker Posey, who is very kind of. Very, very Parker Posey. Um, her, just her general wonderful self, but also a bit, you know, out there. Um, and he, he describes her in the movie as she makes coffee nervous. <laughs> um, and um, both of them are very good and really work well at kind of keeping this balance of... They kind of... Parker Posey's character is kind of set up where you kind of know Hanks is going to it's going to eventually break up with her. Um, but the way Meg Ryan and Canera's relationship is kind of played off, you kind of wonder, like, you know she probably wants to leave him, and there's really not a connection between them, but there's maybe a possibility they don't split up. It's hard, it's hard to tell up until that point, not really, if you've seen any movies, but there, you, there is a bit of a question, unlike with the Hanks and Posey scenario. Um, and as I said, though, he's great in pretty much everything he does. There's one particular scene I love in this, when he's finally, after all this time, starting to lose his school a little bit. And he and Meg Ryan go to the movies, and they're kind of talking, and the uh, the let's go to the lobby thing is playing on the screen. You can just kind of hear it. We don't see it, we just hear it. And then this woman gets pissed off because they're talking, and she's, uh, she just turns around and does the, do you mind? And he, just very, trying to keep this cool, but being very angry, just says, a hot dog is singing. What are you missing? A hot dog is singing. <laughs> Um, and then that leads into, um, one of this movie's more impressive scenes, which is, um, this movie, basic as it is, though charming, probably has one of the best breakup scenes in movie history. <laughs> because you think breakup scenes in movies, and you think drama, you think contrivance, you think we're really just doing this to get to the plot, you really, there's just a lot of false notes in a lot of breakup scenes, because they're clearly just there for a plot device. So that they can either get back together or they can break up so one can be with another. Um, but they just go, they sit down, and Kinnear says, I've come to the conclusion that this is great, but I'm not in love with you. And she says, holy shit, I'm not in love with you either. And he's like, really? And it's just, uh, do you have somebody? I, I don't know, maybe. Do you have somebody? And, it, and it's just this completely, totally mutual, non-dramatic thing. And it's over. <laughs> and that's it there's and then we never see Kinnear again there's no reason to there's no she has no beef with him there was no big 
you're seeing one guy and all this because he would there's a jane adams cameo where she's like a news anchor that he likes um who that she the uh, she interviews him and there's like a connection and then of course she's got the hanks thing going on she's still kind of keeping under wraps anyway um and it all just kind of flows nicely together um except for the fact that they hate each other in real life and don't realize one is the other until he and dave chappelle go to meet her when they're gonna do kind of a blind date thing and Chappelle goes and looks first and realizes that it's her and tells him. So he knows and she doesn't for pretty much the remainder of the movie. Um, and that could bring us into contrivance and kind of does bring us into overlength. Um, but there's still some kind of nice directions they go with it. It's worth noting while we're on supporting characters, yeah, uh, Dave Chappelle is basically the token black best friend in the romantic comedy that's there to kind of somewhat give advice while walking side by side with our hero and not doing a whole lot else. Again, this was never really, played when this movie came out. Which is really funny because um, if you've heard him tell the story a few times, Dave Chappelle was supposed to be Bubba in Forrest Gump. Right. But he turned it down because he thought the movie was going to bomb. And I guess this is his way of making up for it by being in a movie with Tom Hanks. He got to survive this one. Yeah. <laughs> um... So yeah, obviously it's no Forrest Gump, but it's kind of somewhat of like, it feels like an amends of sorts that Dave Chappelle was in this. Um, and then we have Steve Zahn, who works at the bookstore with Meg Ryan and Gene Stapleton, who is basically the, Betty White has since taken that role over of the, the kind of, um, the old lady that's kind of there for some comedy relief and is there to be old and charming and, <laughs> and that's pretty much it. Um, it's also worth noting that, um, kind of All in the Family is kind of taking out of place here, because Gene Sableton's in this and Rob Reiner's in this. So nice. those side characters are kind of, we have that connection going on. Um, so, yeah, and then, oh, and, uh, obviously I mentioned that Downey Coleman is the, uh, he always plays the boss character, but there's a reason he does, and that's because he does it really well. Yes. Um, I particularly love his scene when the, uh, the protesters are outside, uh, the big bookstore, because they don't want her shop to close down and he's this big corporation and evil and stuff like that and just the way he delivers the, he's talking about the protesters and the way he delivers the line yeah that's annoying it's pissing me off actually <laughs> he's just so calm about it um and then there's i think that's that about covers the supporting cast of like recognizable faces um, because as I said, even though, um, we could have gone into a bunch of contrivances once he finds out, but she doesn't know, um, there's still some funny directions I take that, like, when, um, he doesn't show, obviously he doesn't, he shows up for the blind date, but she doesn't know that him being there means he is showing up for the blind date because she doesn't know it's him. So, the next day, Steve Zahn sees in the paper that this guy who was running a muck called the Rooftop Killer was arrested at about the time they would have been meeting. And so she's trying to figure out why he didn't show up. And Steve Zahn has basically convinced her that the guy she was emailing is the rooftop killer. <laughs> uh, I thought that was kind of a, it doesn't really go anywhere, but I just thought that was kind of a funny little thing to throw in there. Oh, for sure. Um, and this is one of those concepts where, uh, maybe this is just me, I don't know, or the way I communicate with people or what, but um, this movie gets brought up a lot when you talk about movies that have dated. Um, but I'm not really, I mean, yeah, people don't, you know, go through the internet like that and have the You Got Mail and stuff like that. America Online. But there are, it, that's still very much a thing for people to communicate anonymously. Oh, yeah, and completely. Find, and find connections. Especially in chat rooms. So if anything, I feel like it's holding up really well, just in a slightly different method. Yeah. So, uh, just because it's like the old school email is, I think, why people think it's you know, not as holding up, but I, I think it holds up. That's definitely something that's really happening now, just not, you know, like I said, just not with the old school shitty <laughs> this, is when, this is when America Online was like the greatest thing in the world, too. Yeah. If, if anything, back then, this movie looked like more of a cash grab, probably. Right, exactly. <laughs> we were um, all getting email, got, getting messages in our actual mailboxes of the discs that gave us many, many hours of free and then there's that, there's that one scene that pain we all know and feel have at least once when everything's great and everything's good and then she he doesn't show he supposedly doesn't show up for the blind date and she goes home and there's that one really sad moment 
where she opens the internet and she doesn't hear it. Yep. And that, <laughs> it's just like, oh. That used to be, that used to <laughs> suck back when I first turned on my computer every day. And that look on her face. I because, know. <laughs> because Meg Ryan is so, like, Meg Ryan was the absolute bee's knees in the 90s. Oh, yeah. As far as that woman that, like, was the... Not only was she, like, the woman in movies that everybody wanted, but she seemed like somebody that could be in real life. Like, there, was, there are those unobtainable, like, you know, movie characters where it's, like, the woman is so perfect, it's, like, she would never clearly exist in the real world, and it's just some kind of, like, men's fantasy or whatever. Her 90s romantic comedy characters feel like those people that are out there and you want to find. Like a Marilyn Monroe? <laughs> um, mm, <I> don't <laughs> Well, no, you see where I'm going with this. Yeah. Um, and she's just, she's just like the definition of lovable. I especially like that little scene where he's convinced her to fight for, you know, what she wants to stand for and believe in. So there, she's just kind of off to the side throwing her fists around. It's like, oh my God, I just, we all just love her. And there's the, and we totally buy it when he's saying he's never this is right before he finds out it's actually her mm -hmm. he doesn't know yet right and he's going to the restaurant with Chappelle and he's confiding in him and saying you know like I've never seen this woman's face I've only seen the text that she writes but this is so much like if I go in there and she's attractive I'm probably just going to propose to her like meeting her for like for five seconds just by the connection that they have made without even seeing each other's faces just through text He's like, I would totally, I would totally marry her. Like, just like that. And we totally buy it. Oh, yeah. Especially since that person's Meg Ryan. <laughs> um, so, but, and it's, and it's another one of those things where despite the fact that we have what was back then modern technology, which is still modern technology now, just like, like that, a different Amped form. up a little bit. Um, it's a classic love story regardless. Yeah. Because in, um, in the original, it was by post, obviously. Right. So, it's the same thing, just more instantaneous. Um, so, it's very much a classic story. It just happens to have this... It's very much the modernization of a classic story. That's exactly what it is. Um, they even throw, like, classic songs. At, both this and this and the other use the classic songs to kind of bring about the classic feel. Um, and then there was... Um, and the great thing that they do is... Um, there's a really, really great scene where it's the whole, you know, it seems like this thing where, um, <laughs> of all people, Tarantino was on Stephen Colbert talking about romantic comedies, mm -hmm. and they got to talking about this movie. And of course, we know Tarantino's taste is a little odd, especially for the type of movies that he makes. And he was talking about how much he loves romantic comedies, and they were Colbert brought this one up, and they were actually, he was actually talking about how he had a really long discussion with critics about how... If anything, this movie is a really good representation of big corporations taking out small ones and like a serious dissection of that, that whole concept. Um, and it's like one of the few movies to really capture that in a realistic way. <laughs> um, and then of course, Colbert had to bring up the point of since they end up together, uh, obviously she basically sells out and goes into this. <laughs> but when you say that though, um, there's a really, really great scene towards the end where um, she finally gives in and goes inside his store to see what the big competition is. And throughout the movie, we've been, we, it's kind of been an unseen force. We just know it's a big corporation that's taking over and knocking out the little people. But then she goes inside it and realizes that it's a really happy place with a lot of smiling children and all the, you know, the books you could ask for except the out-of-print ones. And she actually starts to kind of get emotional in there. And it's, it's a place that she would always have loved to have been in. It just happens to be the place that's taking out her small little store. But it's it's definitely not the evil corporation within. So there's still a kind of uh, catharsis despite the fact of how it actually turns out. Um, so, yeah. Um, there's, there's more to this movie than you probably think. Do you think her screen name was an homage to the original film? Well, the place is called The Shop Around the Corner. Hmm. So, mm. Um... So, yeah. In no relation to the uh, really good Steve Martin movie with Claire Danes and Jason Schwartzman. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, we're going to move on quickly to Sleepless in Seattle, which is, well, like I said, I feel like the more well-known and beloved one. It's kind of the go-to. Oh, yeah. Especially in uh, early 90s romantic comedy. Even uh, says that on the front of the DVD case. Yeah. The film that started it all. 
And uh, the thing about this one is, once again, it's more or less the same thing. Um, technically, it's this one being the same thing, but still. This case has a scratch on it. Um, where it's actually quite a serious... It's This one. This one's a lot more comedic. This one has a lot of kind of heavy dramatic elements in it. It's actually, um, for the first half hour or so, it feels a lot like Kramer versus Kramer. Um, because he, well, instead of the wife leaving, um, she has died. So, a lot of it at the start is Hanks and the kid, Jonah, trying to live together and kind of get through this, uh, losing her. So he decides to, uh, move, I think it's from Chicago to Seattle, uh, in hopes of not being able to be around anything in his vicinity that could remind him of her. So just be in a totally and completely different place. Uh, but that turns out to not be very helpful because the pain is always still going to be there. Um, so Jonah calls in a radio show and basically puts all this out there and ends up getting him on the phone and him talking about this and Meg Ryan is driving to meet Bill Pullman and on this car ride she hears this whole thing go down and immediately feels a connection and starts weeping. So and of course though she is engaged to Bill Pullman so she's kind of stuck um, despite the fact that once again there's always something or multiple things keeping them apart and it's only a matter of time before they can finally their storylines converge. Uh, their paths cross. So, um... We... Let, let's talk about this Bill Pullman story real quick. Because <laughs> um, there are some interesting ways to look at this. Which are, um... Once again, um... There's not... The other significant other is not portrayed as a bad person. Why they normally are, because that makes it easier for one to go from one to the other. It's kind of like, um... And it's also kind of like um, what I was talking about with Pretty in Pink, where it's, um, when you watch Pretty in Pink, we've all been Ducky, and we all really, really, at some point, and we all really want Ducky to get her. Right. But at the same time, we can't be mad at the ending because Blaine is a really nice guy, and very good for her, too. So, the question is, is how do we go about this as far as, there's really not a whole lot wrong with Bill Pullman. So... We can't necessarily say, oh, fuck Bill Pullman, we want her to be with Tom Hanks. Um, the only issue is that um, he's seen as, like, a boring guy. Which, you know, you people will be boring, but it's not necessarily... You don't want them condemned immediately. You don't... Like, it wouldn't just be enough for you to say, oh, he's fucking boring, ditch him. Uh, and he's allergic to everything, and he quotes Pride of the Yankees. <laughs> Um, I, lo I love, uh, her kind of, kind of the way the families are, and he's trying to quote, uh, Gary Cooper in Pride of the Yankees, and the guy in the background's just like, historical reference. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's allergic to everything, and he snores, and he's just kind of a, he's just kind of somewhat of a drag. Like, there's nothing real bad about him, it's just, he's just not that guy that gives her that totally in love feeling, despite the fact that... She, like, when she gets, you know, cards or whatever, she kind of gets giddy, and they're still... Like, she's really, really trying, but that's the thing, though, is she's kind of having to try to love him, as opposed to really, really having that connection with him. Um, so that's a very interesting storyline, and how, how they're able to kind of handle it without it just seeming like she's just kind of ditching him. Because um, it's very... As you can probably see, there's... Like when, like when he's kind of being his very predictable self, and it's almost and when like the ring when he gets the ring and she says it's exactly the ring I would have gotten. In one way, it's like yes, that's great. We're meant for each other because we went for the same thing. But at the same time, that means that there's pretty much no surprises to her whatsoever. And she says like yeah, surprises are overrated. But you can tell she's really, really trying to convince herself that she's happy with Bill Woman as opposed to actually being. So it's really nothing he's doing wrong. It's just it's just not there. Um, so I, that's a really good approach to take to a story like that. It's always kind of it's always so lazy when they make the other guy just an all around douche because you know immediately where it's gonna go. Um, but there's there's an actual conflict when the dude is you know not a bad dude, <laughs> um, just not necessarily right for 
her, or she doesn't feel like is what she's looking for. Um, which we've, once again, um, I'm really, really not a love at first sight person. I just, that's like, it's, it's really unhealthy to think that that's, that's a thing. Um, but their chemistry, like I said, though, is so good that just her driving and listening to him on the radio, she is able to make you believe with her performance that what she was looking for, that she doesn't have with Bill Pullman, she finds in a guy that she's only heard on the radio. And then there's the one moment where they see each other once, and they know it's there, and they feel it, and they both know it, but then the movie's just constantly trying to keep them apart. Um, this is kind of, the, like I said, the movie doesn't make you, like, believe in that, but as far as these characters go, um, I can feel the connection they have. Regardless. The fact, also the fact probably that I know in the back of my head they're fucking fictional characters. But <laughs> still, um, as long as the connection is real, you feel it within the movie, um, that's all that matters. Um, and there's also a lot of comedy to be had with, uh, the character of Jonah. While there's also, you know, some drama here, um, a lot, a lot of the stuff with his character really is comedic, regardless of the, like I said, some of those serious Kramer versus Kramer moments they have. Um, cause there's the whole thing where he doesn't like the new girlfriend who laughs like a hyena and is very annoying and just really, just, just, just a no all around. Like, once again, not a bad person, but just, no, not, <laughs> not you. Um, so there's, um, he has a lot of the good dialogue too, which is, um, there's this, I love the stuff where, um, it's, he's so not used to being a single dad still. He starts to kind of have conversations with Jonah he probably shouldn't be until he finally catches himself. Uh, one of which is when uh, they're brushing their teeth and he says, um, so when you find a new girlfriend, are you guys going to have sex? And his response at first is, I hope so. <laughs> and then it's not until he starts talking about like, you know, I hear women scratch you up when you have sex until he finally says, wait, how do you know this? Why are you saying this? <laughs> Um, and also on, um, on Jonah's side of the story, um, there's a really trying performance from Gabby Hoffman, back when she was still little, um, as his friend that kind of convinces him to go out and find Meg Ryan, uh, after she, she writes a letter and then Rosie O'Donnell sends it behind her back. Uh, <laughs> so the connection is kind of made for them. So, um, and yes, we have, um... Rosie O'Donnell here as the friend, being early 90s Rosie O'Donnell, back when every, pretty much everybody still loved her. There wasn't, was there a lot of controversy with her back then, or did everybody pretty much love her at that no, time? No, everybody loved her at that time. And then there was, um... There's Betty Rubble, come on. <laughs> yeah. And, um, her talk show was kind of cool, too. Her talk show had a really <laughs> sweet set, too, that I actually got to be on the set of when I was in New York. Um, and then there is, um, his side of the family, who is, um, weirdly Rita Wilson. <laughs> and, uh, her husband, Victor Garber. Um, who I, I love seeing in this, uh, in the small part. He, he's only there for a long, for a short amount of time, but, um, I just love Victor Garber whenever he's there. Um, and there's that really funny scene where she starts to talk about how their life is basically an affair to remember. And he's, it's just really funny the way Hanks plays this kind of, like he's trying to be macho about it, where Rita Wilson tearfully explains what an affair to remember is. And Hanks' only response to it is, that's a chick movie. <laughs> and then they, he and Victor Garber start tearing up talking about the Dirty Dozen just to make fun of her. <laughs> um, I always thought that was a really good scene. But, uh, yeah, bringing that in, um, if there's one way this movie kind of somewhat falls short, I guess, it's that, um, for starters, um, it got an original screenplay Oscar nomination, which is a big deal, especially for a romantic comedy. Um... But the thing about it is, is this movie is so reliant on that, um, kind of connotation with an affair to remember. Mm. Basically, this movie is an affair to remember. Like, it really, really, I mean, I know the whole point is their life kind of starts to become that movie, but still, um, their life's kind of becoming that movie. And it's kind of, um, there's kind of a flip side of doing your own thing and using that movie, and it kind of, but there's still, um, it still manages to find itself in a good place, regardless of that. Um, there was, uh, yeah, another, <laughs> I've never looked at this, another Jonah line that I love is, um, when he's on the phone again with the station and he's, like, making out with his girlfriend and he's just saying, like, 
oh, she's a hoe. And it's, oh my god, my dad's been captured by a hoe. <laughs> and then it's, they have to sit down with him and say, no, she's not a hoe. <laughs> it was funny back then, too, and it's still funny now. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yes, and it's, um, there is another scene, to, to their credit, is true, apparently. Because An Affair to Remember is never a movie I really took to. Like, I found it to be a real bore and just kind of... I, I normally love um, Cary Graham movies, but that one never... That one never stopped. I also love that whole thing about how do you pronounce Deborah Kerr's name. And it's like, that's something I still don't know. I say Kerr uh-huh. because it's spelled like Kerr. Right. But, I don't know, there's multiple pronunciations. But um, I love that this movie actually acknowledged, like, which one is it? <laughs> but the thing about it also is... Um, I say that, that I didn't really take to an affair to remember, and I really, you know, don't particularly care for it. Even rom- romantic movies of that era were really romantic at the time. Right. Like, that was in Breakfast at Tiffany's territory, which is a movie I just melt for. <laughs> um, but they're watching it, and they're crying, and then Meg Ryan says, men just do not get this movie. I was like, what? in any other case, I'd say, wow, what a sexist thing for that movie to say, but... It, I don't care for an affair to remember, so that must be the case. <laughs> I don't know. But, um, yeah. So, and of course, you know, we have our very, this, the Empire State Building thing is a lot more memorable now for this than an affair to remember or love affair or any of those. So, um, it definitely made its place, and it's definitely one of those go-to movies where, like, but the cable guy, Women Are Talking for Sleepless in Seattle, and <laughs> it's that kind of go-to movie that really bring people together. Um, so, yeah, like I said, you know, there's contrivances in there, and, you know, all that stuff that you would absolutely hate in movies nowadays because it's just so played out, and it just feels like such a... Let's just keep them apart as long as possible just so it makes it better. And I love the fact that we don't really get a glimpse of them together like they find each other at the top of the empire state building and we kind of get a glimpse i don't know when they're walking back down the way she's looking at him i can never tell if that's the yeah this is gonna work or i don't really it's kind of like the graduates ending where it's like it's kind of mistaken for the yes they're going off together but it's more of the oh fuck what have they done ending when you look at it um i'm curious i think we're supposed to take it for the romantic ending that they're going to be together for. I'd and say that's, so. right, that's the ending we want to take it for because right. there's a romantic in all of us somewhere. Yes. Um, so, yeah, but as soon as they meet on the Empire State Building, finally, after the entire movie has been leading to this, we stop. And we don't know what they're like together. <laughs> and it's, it's very interesting to wonder where this movie went after its credits rolled. Um, but once again, though, we all like to think that they... Oh, I'm sure they did. So, um, and if not, if you don't feel that way, the song that's playing is telling you to. The song that plays in those Coke commercials now. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I'm about even on them, but if I had to just take it as far as, you know, which one has really made its place in this genre and really made itself a classic, uh, I, we're clearly looking at Sleepless in Seattle. Alright. But, yeah, I'm about even on them, though, so there's that. Well, enjoy the rest of your day. And whatever you may be doing tonight or today, and uh, watch the BAFTAs if you're so inclined. We have a prediction video that's up from yesterday. Check that out if you're feeling interested into it. And next week, we have talked about Tom Hanks. Now we're going to talk about Michael Douglas and his really bad taste in women. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to happen next week. Yep. There's three choices. Which two are they? You probably know. We don't do three ways here on Versus. Hence why it's called Versus. <laughs> Maybe someday we'll see if we can do it. Though, given the erotic nature. Yeah, that's a good point. (laughs) Yes. You never know. Maybe we will. Oh, by the way, um, what we've always been saying does not apply to Captain Zeta Jones. We love Captain Zeta Jones. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, that's enough. So that being said, I want to thank you guys and girls out there for watching. AJ, any parting words? That's it.